Turn with me once again to the book of Romans, chapter number 10. And I believe that we will finish this study today. I don't know if it'll be this morning or if it'll be this evening, but we'll finish it this, this week unless the Lord prevents it. <clears throat> the book of Romans, chapter number 10. And I'm going to begin reading in verse number 17, and our focus will be verses 18 through 21. It says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not, or did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. <clears throat> by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith, all day long I have stretched forth mine hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Folks, there's a lot in those last few verses. That's why I say I don't know that I'll finish it this morning. I'll be doing well to get out of verses 18 and 19 this morning. The first question there in verse number 18 is, But I say, have they not heard? Folks, if you apply that to the day of Israel when Paul was writing this, they had had the Old Testament. They had had the prophets. They had had the Lord Jesus Christ. They had Paul on the at the time. They had the church. <clears throat> what am I saying? They had heard. If you remember last week, I, pre I opened up by talking about the general call, and I'm not going to go over that in depth again. But that call had, in fact, gone out. John the Baptist gave the call. He came preaching, repent ye. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came into Galilee, was preaching, repent ye, and believe the gospel. Paul had said earlier in this book, it was read during Sunday school class, in Romans 3, verse number 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Salvation had been preached. Well, let's bring it forward to today. Have they not heard? Folks, I want you to think about that for just a minute. Has America heard? They've heard and heard and heard and heard, haven't they? Folks, there has been gospel preached in America for many years. You know, as I start with verse number 17, I did it to make this application. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I believe Paul was making this same application here. And I made this example down at Endor on Thursday night. There is a difference between hearing and believing. Well, what do you mean? Unless they, as long as a person has the ability to hear, I'll put it that way, they can hear what the preachers are saying, can't they? <clears throat> we preach, we preach, we preach. People have heard. Folks, I don't think it's working real well this morning, but we normally have a streaming broadcast that goes out of here. That's available worldwide. And I will tell you that it's used worldwide. 
I don't have the paperwork in front of me, nor am I too concerned about getting it. Just, I think we're up to 32 or 33 countries in, worldwide now. <clears throat> Other churches have many more. The gospel has gone out. I think back, and I may flip back here in just a few minutes to the parable of the sower. In Luke chapter number 8, if you remember last week when we read the parable of the sower, I made the comment, the Lord didn't blame the seed. Matter of fact, the Lord said the seed is the word of God. <clears throat> well, folks, that means the seed is not the fault, doesn't it? You know what? The word of God is the only seed I know of that's had a 100% germination rate. Well, you say, but not everybody that hears has been saved. Well, that's true. Well, you know what the Bible tells us in Isaiah 55? The word of the Lord's going to accomplish that whereunto it is sent. <clears throat> that means it's successful with what it's doing or what it's meant to do. So the problem is not the seed. And then we come down through there and we see that the Lord does not put any fault at the, at, at, on the sower. Folks, every time I think about sowing seed, I'll be honest, I think about going out there and putting seed in a row. But even at that, <clears throat> sometimes we, we mark that row out. We wind up dropping a seed on a rock. And if you all have ever done that, you know that seed looks like a piece of rubber hitting that rock. It bounces to who knows where. But folks, when you think about it this way, I'm going to use grass seed for an example because it's something we're all familiar with, I believe. How do you sow grass seed? Do you go out there and put one little grain down at a time in a row? You broadcast that stuff, don't you? You throw it or you spread it. You have some way, you, you do a large area, you broadcast it. Same thing is true in these large fields. They, now I know nowadays they've got these nice planters, but used to be they broadcast seed. Well, if you're out there and you're throwing that seed and trying to spread that seed to sow that field, guess what? Some of it's going to go by the wayside, isn't it? Some of it's going to fall in the rocky area. Some of it's going to fall in the weeds. Notice the word some that I use there. Where does most of it fall? Most of it's going to fall in the good ground, isn't it? Folks, the fault was not the sower. The fault was the ground. America has heard. Israel, at the time of Paul, had heard. But they did not believe. You notice the last part of verse 18 says, Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. If you study the life of Paul, Paul went through his missionary journeys and they were successful in bringing the gospel into all of the known world at the time. Paul appeared before Caesar. Paul appeared before the rulers of Israel. <clears throat> Paul took the gospel to many places. I believe, and I don't think there's too much of a stretch, I believe Paul even spoke the gospel to the barbarians on the Isle of Melita. He was there. I'm looking at Acts chapter number 28, verse number 1. He was there. keep going back through there I wanted to get back a little bit farther and I got distracted by that when you look at Acts chapter number 23 Acts chapter number 23 
And I'm going to begin reading in verse number 10. It says, When there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. What was the Lord doing here? Through the persecution of Paul, the Lord was spreading the gospel, wasn't he? <clears throat> You've testified of me at Jerusalem. Now you're going to go testify of me at Rome. Folks, Paul... had a great ministry. Flip over to chapter 24. Chapter number 24 of Acts. And <clears throat> let me begin reading in verse 22. It says, When Felix heard these things, Having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, When Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard, heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Well, folks, what was happening here? Felix was going to hear the gospel, wasn't he? <clears throat> and as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might lose him. <coughs> Wherefore, he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. But after two years, Porcius Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. And I could keep reading into chapter 25, and we could see where Paul... Testified before Agrippa and before Festus, but I won't this morning. Folks, Paul declared the gospel. Of course, John the Baptist declared the gospel. Peter declared the gospel. James, all of them. The Lord Jesus Christ proclaimed the gospel. Folks heard. Folks, if you remember back in John chapter number 4 when Christ was with the woman at the well of, in Samaria, <clears throat> do you remember what happened there? First off, the Bible says he must need to go through Samaria. Why did Christ need to go through to, go to, to Samaria? He had lost sheep there, didn't he? Folks, I've been thinking a lot, and primarily because we've been doing a lot in preparation for a couple things with this work in Kenya. I don't know what the Lord has for us there. But I believe he's got lost people there. I believe he's got saved people there. I believe he has a work there. And you know what? Let me read it directly from Scripture. Back to Acts chapter number 13. I know we dealt with this last week. Acts chapter number 13. And I will... Read part of this reading now and read part of it later. 
in verse number 47, it says, For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Now, folks, we ought to rejoice in that because we're included in that, aren't we? We don't dwell in Jerusalem. We don't dwell in Judea. We don't even dwell in Israel. We are, in fact, Gentiles. But then in verse number 48, and when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained unto eternal life believed. Then if you go back to the book of Acts and in, let's see if I can get pages apart, chapter number two. And in verse number 41, it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. <clears throat> Folks, I'm reading this to kind of get into the second half of this thought. You see here that there are those <clears throat> that gladly receive his word. There are those that are saved. You see that there are those who are, who are ordained to eternal life. And you see the Lord adds to his church daily such as should be saved. But folks, I want you to notice something with me this morning. And I'm going to be very brief with this thought because we've covered it a lot lately. You notice the words ordained, believed, and added, particularly with the word added, notice the fact the Lord added. What am I driving at here? Salvation is solely of the Lord. No amount of preaching can save a person. No amount of me up here standing and pounding the pulpit and screaming and jumping up and down is going to save a person. And those of you that have been here for very long know if I start screaming, I'm out of a voice pretty quick. <laughs> if I start jumping up and down, you all better come up here and see what's at my feet trying to bite me. <laughs> but folks, none of that would save a soul. No amount of me doing anything is going to save us all. It's of the Lord. So that brings us back to our question in verse number 18. Have they not heard? Yes, they've heard. The gospel has gone out. The word of God has been published. The word of God has been spread Once again, the problem is not with the sower or the seed. Go back to Romans chapter number 10. I want to read verse number 19 now. Now, I'm not going to cover very much on 19 because it, it literally continues the same exact thought as verse number 18. I may read a couple more verses, but I'm not going to do a whole lot more. But I say, did not Israel know? First, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. And by a foolish nation, I will anger you. Folks, as we know, <clears throat> and I, I'm 
I'm not sure how I'm going to go forward from here. I may continue into chapter 11. I don't know. But as we know, chapter 10 is building into chapter number 11 because when this was written, when Paul sat down and wrote this letter to the, uh, to the Romans, you know what? There was no chapter, there was no verse. It was all one continuous thought. There may be many thoughts within that, but it was all one continuous writing. Chapters and verses were added where, I, where pastors could come up here and say, all right, turn to Romans chapter number 10, and we're going to look at verse number whatever. Makes it easier for us to find it. I mean, could you imagine me up here saying, turn to page number in my Bible. This is page number 1,201. Look at paragraph 3, line 4. I imagine we'd have some, a hard time finding that, don't you? So chapters and verses were added later. But what's, what, what is building up here? What chapter number 11 has to do with? If you look at verse number 1 of chapter 11, it says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. Folks, if you hear somebody come out and say, well, the church has replaced Israel, no, they haven't. Israel is still God's chosen nation. God's people make up his church, his bride. They're two separate things. <clears throat> Continuing this reading, it says, God, or I'm sorry, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. What ye not, what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And I'll leave off reading there for right this minute. But there is a remnant. There are Israelites that are going to believe. Israel knows. Folks, I heard a preacher say back over the summer, <clears throat> the Old Testament, if you go back and you read the Old Testament and you read what the Old Testament says about Christ, the Jews should have recognized Christ as the Messiah easily. <clears throat> It's all there. The prophecy is there. They should have easily been able to recognize him. But their eyes were blinded. Folks, I believe the Bible speaks about, and I didn't put this in my notes, their eyes were blinded and their ears were stopped. And you know what? There are people in Israel today looking for a Messiah. Still waiting on him to come. <clears throat> but folks, even at that, God hath not cast away Israel. If you go, <clears throat> and I want to start back up, and I'm trying not to uh, read the entire chapter of chapter 11, but I may wind up reading most of it. Chapter 11 of Romans, verse number 11, it says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, <clears throat> through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Folks, if you really study out what's happened here, the Lord has set Israel aside to, and grafted in the Gentiles so that salvation comes to the Gentiles. It says in verse number 12, Now if the fall of them be 
the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, and the lump, or the lump also is holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Pay attention to this, folks. Boast not against the branches. If thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. What is that saying, folks? To put it the way we would say it, we're no better than them. It says in verse number 19, thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. But thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. <clears throat> and they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. And I'll stop there with that. But folks, you see there, the door was open to the Gentiles. But we still cannot sit, sit back here and say, oh, we're so much better than the Jew, because you know what? If it were not for the goodness and the mercy of God, we would be in unbelief too. We'd be right there with him, wouldn't we? <clears throat> Israel knew. And this is that fulfillment of what Moses was saying. By a foolish nation, I will anger you. The Lord brought in the Gentiles. And folks, I mentioned I would go back to Acts chapter number 13 and read the other part of that reading later. It's later. Acts chapter number 13, <clears throat> verse number 44. <clears throat> it says, And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they rejoiced. No, no, that's not what happened, was it? That's what should have happened. I have to stop here for just a minute, folks. I have to mention this. This is a warning to us, I believe. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they will, were filled with envy. Folks, how many times does that happen to us? How many times do we see the Lord bless a church and maybe three or four new, new people are coming? Maybe they've got five or six visitors and the Lord saves a few of them. Maybe a new family moved into the area and we start sitting back and rather than saying, praise the Lord, that church over there is growing, we say, wish they would have come here. Is that the right attitude to have, folks? We must remember God sets people in the church. He sets them where he would have them. And you know
You know what? It isn't, even though it is not always our way, it's not always our church that he would put them in. Verse number 45, one more time, and I might try to finish the verse this time. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. <clears throat> Folks, this is kind of a transition into verses 20 and 21. You notice what Paul said there. The, he said the Jews had judged themselves unworthy of eternal life. They had put the word of God from them. <coughs> Folks, there are times, and I, Caitlin has to help me a whole lot with this because I have a tendency to paint with a broad brush, and it's not always the best thing to do. But there are times I look at our nation and I say they've done the same thing. They've said to the word of God, we don't want to, nope, 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 nope. I don't want, I don't want to have to acknowledge that. They've said of eternal life, it would cost me too much. Well, folks, what do you mean? What do I mean by that? I'd have to give up too much is what I mean by that. I'd have to give up my bad, sinful, wicked habits. Those, if that's what you're saying this morning, if you're hearing my voice and you say, well, I don't want to be a Christian, I'd have to give up my wickedness. Your wickedness then is your God. You love your wickedness rather than God. You judge yourself unworthy or undesiring of, of eternal life. And folks, do not get the wrong idea here. I'm not up here saying you can resist God. Neither was Paul here in this reading in Acts chapter number 13. Folks, I want you to think about this for just a minute. <clears throat> I really want you to think about this for just a minute. Put yourself in Paul's position. You have the Gentiles who the whole city has come out, and they are eager to hear the word of God. And then you have the Jews who are contradicting and blaspheming the word of God. Who are you going to focus on? <clears throat> Don't get any ideas here. I'm pastor of Beauty Mountain Baptist Church. But I, I am going to use this for an example. Outside the walls of this church, I am aware there's Edmond, there's Lookout, there's Lansing, Fayette County, Kanawha County, Raleigh County, Nicholas County. I can keep on naming. There's West Virginia, all the way out to California, and all, you know, the whole of the United States. I'm aware of that. But folks, just think about this for a minute. The way that America is right now, and as, I don't know if this is proper English or not. I forgot to look it up to make sure. Non-receptive of the word of God is what they are right now. It's not a surprise to me that the Lord has brought somebody else in. And it's not a surprise that he's brought them in strong. I was telling Jordan between services, I think if my numbers are correct and I have counted everything properly, right now that's impossible. I think that we are nearing 1,000 people that we are reaching in Kenya. I hope you all understand that to me that's just... Mind-boggling. But 
But folks, when I think about what's happening there, I think about this. This, this, is, this is kind of the catalyst behind this sermon. <clears throat> the series of sermons, I should say. While we see great things happening in Kenya, in the Philippines, in other parts of the world, it should still be our heart's desire and prayer to God for America that they might be saved. If you remember, that's how Paul started this, this chapter. He said, it is my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He is saying, I've gone to the Gentiles. I am the apostle to the Gentiles, but I still have a love for Israel. <clears throat> I still have a desire to see Israel saved. Folks, you know what? That's something to really think about. He closes the chapter. I mean, think about this for just a minute. He's saying, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And then down in verse number 21, well, I'm not going to find it there. It says, but to Israel he saith, all day long I have stretched forth mine hands unto a disobedient and a gainsaying people. Paul here is not closing this chapter, contradicting himself in the beginning of the chapter. He is providing proof. This is what Israel is in right now. Right now, Israel is a disobedient and gainsaying people, but I pray they'll be saved. Folks, right now, America is a disobedient people. Right now, America is a people who does not want to retain God in their knowledge. Right now, America is a people that is trying as hard as they can to get away from God. Rebellious. Folks, I want you to understand with me this morning, and this again is another one of those catalysts that led this series of sermons. We live in a country, get this, Pay close attention to this. This is sickening, to be honest. We live in a country where a teacher is not permitted. In some places, they've tried to say a teacher is not even permitted to have a Bible in their classroom. It's gone that far, folks. You're certainly not allowed to teach out of it because you may infringe upon somebody else's religious freedom. But, uh-oh. There's a word, but. Guess who is being allowed into the schools? I forget how many states. West Virginia has not done it yet, but they are working on it. I, I'm going to tell you right now, they are working on it. Satanic temples allowed in the schools. Bible's not, but Satan is. Drag queens are allowed in the schools. God isn't, but drag, drag, drag queens are. Schools are being sued, folks. This one's, a, this one's sickening. Schools are being sued for not allowing boys and girls to use the opposite restrooms because they, you know, that's what they identify on that given day being sued for not allowing kids to have litter boxes. Mm -hmm. All these things are being allowed in the schools, but God isn't. Folks, what am I driving at? Why, why am I spending a minute here? Here it is, folks. Ready? Satan's after our kids. The devil is after our youth. Folks, my desire, my <coughs> excuse me, my heart's desire and prayer to God for America and for her children is that they might be saved. And not to re-preach the entire series, but verse number two, for I bear them record. What's Paul saying there? What does it mean when we say we bear record? We have evidence, don't we? We're willing to go on record saying this. 
I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, meaning they are religious, but not according to knowledge. Folks, there it is again. America is religious, but not knowledgeable. Religious, but lost. For they going about, or I'm sorry, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted unto the righteousness of God. Disobedient people. Folks, our nation's full of that. Our nation is full of people trying to work their way into heaven by some other means other than what God has set forth. You know, when Jesus said in John 14 and verse number 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, do you remember how that verse ends? That's not the end of it. The rest of the verse says, No man cometh to the Father but by me. There's no other way. When Jesus said, I am the way, that's literally what he meant. I am the way, the only way. If you go back to John chapter number 10, it says he is the door. He is the good shepherd. All that ever came before him were thieves and robbers. They were there for nothing more than to steal and to kill and to destroy. He, is, he has come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. <clears throat> Folks, I know we look at America right now and we say it is a disheartening, discouraging time. But you know what we need to do? Paul gives us an example as to what we need to do. We need to pray. We need to cry mightily out unto God for our nation and pray that he would save, save us. And not only that, you know what else? You, you heard me mention when I first opened this sermon Paul's desire and Paul's prayer caused him to do something. What did it cause him to do? Preach. Folks, that's been the theme of this whole chapter. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And I want God to use me to do it. <clears throat> Folks, that's where we need to come to in our life. We need to come to the point where we say, my heart's desire and prayer to God for, it, for America, rather, is that they might be saved. And I want the Lord to use me to do it. It's no good to leave it at, 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 at that they might be saved because, folks, we've covered pretty thoroughly. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's got to be someone to send that word of God, doesn't there? There has to be a sower. He wouldn't do any good, folks. He, most of you know, as hard as it is to believe today, spring is coming. I've got my first round of seeds. I need to get busy starting to plant seeds. Stuff that has to grow in the house before it can go outside. If I leave those seed bags closed up, and I leave my dirt out on the porch where it's 30 degrees and frozen. <clears throat> and I don't bother putting the dirt in the trays and putting the seeds in the dirt. Can I get mad when I don't have any plants later? I can, can't I? But whose fault will it be? It'd be mine, wouldn't it? Folks, we have the seed. <clears throat> right here it is. It's good seed. We have the ground. It's all over. At this point, I almost would submit we have a harvest. That's what the Lord said, wasn't it? The field's white already to harvest, but the laborers are few. Whether it be sowers or reapers that we need right now, you know what? We need laborers. If it is truly our heart's desire and prayer to God for America that they may be saved, we would pray the Lord would make us a laborer in his cause. I will stop there for this morning. That actually does conclude our study.